think uh, let's, let's start the seminar. It's a pleasure to have Toke added with us today for seminar. Toke is a university reader at the Faculty of Economics, University of Cambridge. He's also the director of studies in economics at Jesus College, and he's also the director for the Keynes Fund. Toke's broad areas of research are public choice and political economics. Um, he's a prolific researcher who has published in the very best general interest economics journals. He is the editor of the European Journal of Political Economy, and he's also on the editorial board of public choice and constitutional political economy. Today, Toke will be presenting his paper on franchise extension and fiscal structure in the United Kingdom, 1820 to 1913, a new test of the redistribution hypothesis. Toke, thanks again for taking out the time to present your paper with us. You have one hour and 15 minutes in total, including questions. You have the option of taking questions on the go, or you can defer them towards the end of the seminar. With that, the mic is yours. Thank you very much for that. It's a, it's a pleasure to uh, kind of be there, here. Uh, hopefully in the future, I'll be able to come and visit an actual person. On the other hand, the advantage of this sort of new world is that we can actually sort of engage with people in places we would not that often visit in real, in real life. Um, the um, paper that we're going to be talking about here, as uh, Gary has already pointed out, is about redistribution and the franchise extension, and it's some joint work with, uh, with Stan and Peng. Um, <clears throat> so let me just uh, kick off by, uh, uh, by sort of giving you a bit of a broad introduction to what this is about. So one of the fundamental questions in political economics of public choice is if there is a causal relationship between democratization and the involvement of the government in the economy. And that is often formulated as a sort of general proposition, is often formulated as a more specific hypothesis as we, we have to give it a name, so we call it the redistribution hypothesis, which is that if you hand out voting rights to new groups of voters, and if these new voters happens to be poorer than the old voters, then there will certainly be some demand for government-sponsored redistribution and one would therefore expect to see an expansion of government involvement in the economy. And this prediction in sort of various uh, sort of disguises is embedded in pretty much every theoretical model of political economy that one can think of. It's sitting in the median voter model, it's sitting in the probabilistic voting model, and it's also a core ingredient to so some of the theories that have been developed over the last 15, 20 years about why it is that uh, governments back in the 19th century handed out voting rights uh, to, to the broader segments of the population. So the Asimovil Robinson model, for example, of franchise extension have this hypothesis sitting right in the middle. That's the reason in that model why the elite does not want to hand out voting rights to the poor if they can avoid it. So this is a central hypothesis to, uh, to lots of uh, theoretical models in political economy. And it also has, uh, if you like, it sort of, uh, it passes the smell test, right? It sounds right. It, 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 it's, it's kind of something that we would uh, probably agree on or, or a beer that uh, this, this seems a reasonable hypothesis to have. So given all that, it's somewhat surprising that the evidence that we have on this is mixed and surprisingly weak. And what we're gonna do in this paper is to take a look at this question again so the question is, does franchise extension cause redistribution or more involvement in, by the government in the economy more generally? Uh, we're gonna take a new look at that with a new uh, econometric technique that uh, at least when we started out on this, we had a hope that that would uh, help us uh, sort of cut through the, uh, through the mixed results in the literature and get something clear. Uh, I can sort of reveal up front that uh, we're not gonna produce a smoking gun here so what we're gonna get at the end of this is, uh, is something that sort of falls into the bag of mixed results. But nonetheless, I think it's an interesting technique and I think it has some promise to be applied to this type of problem and many other problems as well. I'm very happy to take questions as we go along. Uh, so uh, just bought in if, I, if you have something that, that you would like to ask or something that is not clear. Okay, let me just say a little bit about where the literature stands on this question. As I said, the literature is uh, coming up with mixed results. So we, 
uh, in terms of uh, what this relationship is. And most of the literature uh, is uh, running uh, regressions of the type that I have written down on the top of the slide here. So if we imagine that we have some fiscal outcome that captures some redistribution in some particular place I, country, for example, at some point in time T, and then we want to correlate that with uh, <coughs> with some measure of the um, how many people can vote or some other measure for that matter of demo demo democracy or democratization. And then we would like to estimate that beta coefficient there. Now to get a causal estimate on that, we need to think that uh, the um, measure we have of the franchise extension, the suffrage here, the E variable is uncorrelated with the, all the unobservables. Of course, that's a, a big ask. But in some cases, we can think about the franchise reforms as natural experiments. For example, if you're thinking about looking at this within a country, uh, say the United Kingdom, then the British Parliament might change the rules for how the local governments can, uh, who can vote in local government elections. And from the perspective of local government, or particularly local government, maybe it's reasonable enough to assume that the extension of the vote in franchise that's coming from that route would be uh, close to quasi uh, random. In other cases, it's less uh, easy to uh, support that and one might think about instrumental variable strategies and so on. But the point I wanted to make about this is that if you take an approach like this, whatever way you're estimating the thing, in order to try to estimate that beta, what you are studying is the conditional distribution of the fiscal outcome condition on the, on the, on the franchise. So you're zooming in on that particular statistic to get the inference that you, you're interested in. And you'll see in a second why I'm, I'm stressing this. So if you do this and look at the literature that's done all this, uh, well, you get lots of uh, correlational evidence that kind of show some of the anticipated fiscal responses, but absolutely not on the scale that one would expect given the very strong theoretical prior. Hence, the results are mixed. Can so, I interrupt briefly, sorry. I'm, I'm wondering what um, fiscal shocks are of interest here. Um, when I, I'm familiar, or used to be familiar with the literature on uh, international trade distortions. And if you think of tariffs as being a fiscal intervention, um, then uh, I think the evidence is pretty strong. Um, a, you know, the median voter kind of model um, leads to uh, distortions that favor the wage rates of the low skilled and so forth. Those sorts of results, I mean, uh, all the way back to um, the uh, Stolper-Samuelson theorem and, um, and more recently, you know, Wagner in, in, the, uh, uh, in the 1980s and so forth. So um, uh, is, uh, are you looking separately from that uh, trade related literature? Uh, yes, yeah, so the literature I was sort of referring to here would be looking at, uh, at uh, you see what kind of measures we are looking at, but what people have been looking at is sort of a, at the aggregate level, the size of government and then within composition of taxes, which also would include uh, things about tariffs. I have some work on that, but we did look at, uh, look at the, uh, the question of how democratization uh, changes the tax structure, including what happens to the taxes by coming from international trade. Right. But even with that literature, I think you, you're actually hitting it on the nail there, because in that literature, we also have a, a very strong body of, uh, of, uh, of theoretical work that, that leads us to think the same thing as what I was summarizing here, namely that if we, uh, if we allow poor people to vote, then uh, they would want to uh, see the, the uh, particular change in the, in, the, in the tariff structure, sort of according to the Stolper Samuelson theorem or the other things that would, right. that would give us a prediction that there should be a response. And it's also hard to find that empirically if you look at trade data. Right. There's some evidence, but it, it's not, again, it's not that smoking gun that is just a clear cut stylized fact that this happens on a grand scale when, whenever these uh, extensions take place. Uh, new work on that topic is. Uh... Uh, the, what's problematic is the globalization era, which is driven by other forces uh, and yeah. which has seen um, in, in democracies, which has seen declines in tariffs. Um, and so that means the time series evidence is, is made weak, although the issue there is controlling for the other forces that drive the globalization. I think. Uh, sorry, yeah. I don't mean to interrupt. Yeah, no, I agree with that. So uh, the, I think the best evidence, and in fact, uh, and you see what we're going to do in a second as well. I think uh, one of the best 
at least in my mind, the best way to get a handle in general on some of these questions is to go back in history. Because if you're thinking about these things uh, in with, with sort of in modern times, uh, lots of other things are going on. That's also true historically, but more importantly, um, nowadays, or, uh, nowadays, after the World War II, basically democratization meant changing a lot of things at the same time, where historically in many countries, it was a much more gradual process. You have a chance of isolating different steps in the process. And I think that that has some advantages in trying to un unpack some of these issues. Uh, because you're perfectly right, of course, we need to, the, the challenge is, and that's exactly the challenge with that regression I showed you a second ago, how can you control for all the other things in a credible way to get you a causal estimate of the effect you're interested in. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about this uh, method that we're going to use. It's nothing to do with a vacuum Hoover. It's uh, they're calling the Hoover approach because it was developed by an econometrician called uh, Kevin Hoover, who's now at uh, Duke University in some other context. Okay, so let me just sort of give a, a sort of what I'm going to do now is I'm going to spend a few minutes on uh, sort of explaining what the idea is, and then I will, I will show you an example of how it works in practice, and then I'll show you how we implemented it. Okay, so the question we would be interested in, and in this particular setting, we're interested in the causal relationship between some measure of the extension of the franchise, I'm going to call that E, and a measure of some uh, fiscal outcome, I'm going to call that F. So we want to be interested in whether E is causing F. So that's the question that we are interested in. And of course, logically speaking, there are four possibilities. It could be reverse causality, or it could be what we're interested in, the causality from E to F, or it could be that they're jointly determined, or maybe the two processes are, are totally independent. So the idea in this Hoover approach is to look at both the conditional distribution and the marginal distributions of uh, the, uh, the two variables that we are interested in. So that gives us four distributions in total to think about the conditional each way and the two marginal distributions. And then be looking for structural breaks in those uh, time series processes. If we take that then and combine that with prior historical knowledge about when we anticipate that there might be uh, <coughs> structural breaks in the processes then it might be able to establish the causal order because if the data is generated by one of these uh, relationships here, then we would expect to see particular structural breaks in these four series that allow us to invert that and back out what the underlying data generating process would have been and therefore what the causal relationship between the two variables would be. So that is in a nutshell what this uh, Hoover idea is about. Okay, so let me just sort of try to make that a little bit less mysterious by running through a simple example that uh, hopefully will give you an idea about how this, how this works. So uh, let us assume, so that's the basis of this example, let us assume that the causality is exactly according to the redistribution hypothesis, that is, that uh, it's the franchise extension that is causing the, the fiscal system. So E is causing F. Now we can sort of write the, that down as a data generating process that might look something like this. So with that causal structure, <coughs> E has an effect on F and the causal effect is this alpha parameter here, but there's no effect from, uh, from F to E. So E is just uh, basically running around that sort of a line with some noise about around it. I assume that this noise is normal distributed so I can calculate the distributions, but that's not, not a necessary ingredient to this approach. It just makes it possible to actually show you what this distribution looks like in a second. Okay, so what have we got here? Basically, just to summarize that, so we got a data generating process that looks like this. We're interested in, uh, in basically getting an estimate on that alpha thing here, understanding if that is the structure. So these are the structural parameters of the, of the model. And the idea is that they might break. Right? There might be structural breaks in these things that jump around, which would have implications for the uh, causal order that underlies this. Okay, so that's the basic structure. So with this, we can do a little bit of uh, sort of pen and pencil statistics on this, and then calculate what are the four distributions that we're interested in here. What are these distributions? What do they look like? So what I've written down here, so the notation is this D, 
is the distribution of f conditional e. This is the marginal of the e variable. And this is the other conditional e conditional f and then the marginal for f. And with the structure I had on the previous slide, we can calculate what the distributions are. They're all gonna be normal distributed. So that's what we got there. But the key thing is to notice what, uh, what the mean of these distributions are and how they're gonna be affected if there is a structural break in one of the two structural parameters of the, of the example. So what we can see from this is that under the assumption that it is E that is causing F, we can see that the conditional distribution of F conditional E does not depend on beta, it depends only on alpha. And for the marginal distribution, it's kind of obvious that that only depends on beta, which is the parameter in the equation for the franchise. But the other two distributions is a function, kind of complicated function of both the two structural parameters. Okay, so this you can see already from this, if there is a structural break in uh, one of these parameters, then that's gonna have a differential effect on uh, these distributions. And you Excuse can me. also imagine, I think, that if I've written down the causal structure in a different way, then the distributions I would get out of that would look different. And the way that the alphas and betas would then enter that uh, those, uh, those other distributions would be different. So depending on what the underlying structure is, we're gonna get something that looks like this, where uh, the, uh, any sort of structural breaks in the, in, the, in the underlying parameters are gonna affect these distributions in different ways. And that's sort of the fundamental idea behind this, 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 uh, this approach that we can explore that. So let me show you how we can do that. Excuse me, excuse me, sorry. Yep. Okay, can you go back to the previous slide? <clears throat> Your fuck, no, 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 the next one, start. Yeah, okay. yep. yeah so, but basically here, you're, you're thinking about uh, changes on alpha and betas, but I mean, in principle, also you can have changes on the volatilities as well. Yes. That's exactly right. And in fact, we have I thought, we have thought about that, whether we could exploit that in some way or the other. Um, and because we can see from this that the, the volatility is also affected in the, for the two ones, these two ones here, right, are affected by the, uh, by the, uh, var the uh, structural variables of the model. And of course, also of the variances of it, if that could be exploited in some way. Uh, I don't know what the answer to that is, but I think it is an interesting idea if there's something that could be done on that that, would, that, that could also be used to, uh, to, uh, to do some identification with this. But I think that's an open question, how far one can get with that. Uh, but very good observation. Okay, so let me just sort of uh, run through what I was trying to say on the previous slide. So we have the basic idea that E is causing F, that was our assumption. And then uh, we start looking at sort of uh, structural breaks in the, in the process. So suppose we had a structural break in that the, the beta, which is in the franchise. So something happens to the franchise process that structurally changes the beta. So it could be a franchise extension, so beta goes up. What would we expect to see happening to these distributions? Well, I've written them down here again. What you can see, what we will see, we will see a pattern conditional on this being the, uh, the causal order that the conditional distribution of F on E is stable, but the other three distributions would exhibit a structural break. If we then think about a, an intervention or a structural break in the fiscal system, say a new tax structure or something that comes in there, and again, if the causal structure is that it is E that is causing F, what would we expect to see there? And again, we would expect to see three of them breaking and one of them being stable. In this case, the one that would be stable would be the one that uh, <coughs> the marginal distribution for the franchise itself. Okay, now, can I have a quick, quick question? Yeah. So uh, when you're talking about this distribution, uh, is it, how are you calculating it empirically? Is it over time or within a particular period of time across different? No. Uh, this, this thing here requires time series data because we're going to be doing structural breaks test on it. So in fact, what it does require, so I, I should uh, actually set that on the previous slide. I, I've taken out all the time indexes, that time indexes and all these, uh, all, the, all the relevant variables here. So the E and F has an index T. And in order for this to work, you need to have a, a long time series because you need to be able uh, 
statistically to look at the look at breaks in all these four series in order to implement this empirically. So what we have in mind here is looking at a society over many years, uh, preferably sort of a century or so, that uh, and then then looking for for points in time where there is a, a structural break in uh, both the fiscal process uh, or in the franchise process, and then we're going to be looking at what does it do to these distributions. Okay, so I'm this assuming comes, I'm assuming you're looking for some consequential breaks because in in general you will have some variations both in beta and alpha. But you look absolutely. For I will okay. show you in a second where this is coming from, and that just going back to some of my, my brief summary of this thing. This is why it's very important to use this non-statistical information as well. So you do a history, sort of historical narrative analysis uh, before you start doing any of the structural breaks estimations, in order to have a catalog of uh, of periods where something plausible happened that could have caused a structural break in the relevant uh, in the relevant process. So that, that kind of is locked there, because otherwise, of course, the on a year-to-year -year basis, lots of stuff is happening in terms of small fluctuations, and we don't want that to be picked up as a structural break by mistake. Can, can I follow that up with, with what might be a trivial question? But if you have large regime changes, like you know, somebody moving from an autocracy to democracy, you might have structural breaks on both these variables, right? So, yeah. and how will you identify that? Yeah. I would, that that if if that's the case, that's kind of where I was. So that's why we think we okay. Let me answer the question straight up. If that's the case, then we can't, right? Because if the, these things happen at the same time, uh, let's say so in year X, there is a clear change in the political system. At the same year, they change the entire fiscal structure. Then they happen simultaneously, and that cannot help us here. That will not give us any information here because these two things are happening exactly at the same time, and therefore we cannot have. Uh, uh, both of these patterns at the same time. That's impossible, right? So this is going to be a mix of that statistically and going to be impossible to use for this. So what you need here is to be in a setting, empirical setting, where you can plausibly have breaks in the uh, say democracy side of it, which is not happening simultaneously with the breaks that might happen in the, uh, in the fiscal system. And you'll see with our application how that would pan out. So this cannot be applied to sort of any situation. And in particular, the one that you highlighted there would be a, would be a problematic one for this. It would not that would not be informative for this approach, precisely okay. for that reason that it happens at the same time, and on the grand scale. Okay, so just to recap on this one here. So what I want you to take from this is the following observation. <clears throat> so if we have a structure, we have a the underlying causal pattern is this, then we would expect to see these structures patterns, uh, these break patterns in the in the data when we are looking at it. But it also cuts the other way. If we are seeing this in the data, then we can deduce that this is the this is the uh, the uh, the causal order. And that's basically what we're going to be exploiting. So just to make that a little bit more clear, then the way that we're going to go about this in practice is to use an algorithm that runs something like this. So we're going to do two tests, basically following this kind of logic here. Uh, the first test is that we identify some particular year where we have found that there is a structural break in the conditional for the franchise and the marginal for the franchise. And then we go and check what happens to the other two distributions. Are they stable or not in that particular year or that period? And we can then go down to this table here and then we can work out uh, which is the case. Now you can see that the case that I had in the example on the previous slide, the one that we have E causing F is the one where we have a break in F, but where the conditional is, uh, is stable. So that would give us that causal there. But we could work out the other cases as well. So I just started my example by assuming this was a case. You can start with any of the other ones and then we can work out what, what are the, the patterns that would uh, generate uh, evidence of the other the other possible causal orders. For example, if we had a situation where there are breaks in these two here, uh, but everything is unstable, it means that the two series are independent. And if everything is unstable, for example, then it means that they are all basically jointly determined. So by going through this algorithm here, we can basically find, find out uh, from what we observe in the data, what the underlying causal structure is. And <clears throat> Just sort of to fix ideas, if we are particularly interested in this causal order here, which is what we are interested in because that's the redistribution hypothesis, then basically you can see that the, what we would need to see in order to find evidence of that is that all the uh, 
various uh, series of, uh, of data have to break at the same time, except for the one where we have the fiscal system conditional on the, on the franchise. Can I ask you another quick question? Um, these variables, um, I mean, it's possible to imagine that uh, a democratization of some sort might take place over say three or five years, right? So, um, and in fact, um, I, I guess what you, uh, you could do then is imagine a first, first difference series and look for the point of acceleration of democratization. Yeah. Uh, if you want to find a single year break, right? But isn't it yep. possible that, yep. that you can have these periods of acceleration um, and then uh, an accelerated response, which might be lagged, you hope. You know, it, you're raising some very good points there about how do we implement this in, in, in practice? Because it's always easy enough to say that if we in a particular year, T has a break and these two guys and the one of these guys is stable and the other one is not, then we're done. But of course, this is not how the, the world works in terms of actually getting data to do these things. So we need to think about uh, what are the appropriate lags we might be, we might be allowing for, for in here. And we need to think carefully about what the time series properties of these things are as well. And that is exactly, do we need to uh, think about changes in these things rather than levels in order to, uh, to actually do this? And I'll, I'll get back to that when we actually get to the implementation. So how we try to, to tackle, tackle that. But this, this is where things become more, more uh, sort of, uh, uh, lots of choices needs to be made on that because that's not a straightforward way to, to, to actually implement all these things. So in theory, it's clear enough structural break at the same time for, for free, but not one, then we, we are good, but how do we actually, what do we mean by that empirically is a question to be answered. And I'll, I'll get back to that uh, to show you. Let me just show you that this is sort of, this is sort of the first test. We can do this test here. And if we have this particular pattern here, then we get evidence on the red distribution hypothesis, but we can also do the other one, which is basically, let's look for a year or a period where there's a structural break in the fiscal system. And then once we have established that that is the case, which would mean that the distributions for the fiscal system, both the conditional and the marginal would break in that year. Then we look at the breaks in the other two. And that can also give us evidence of the redistribution hypothesis. But we need in that case is that, um, <coughs> that, the, um, that we are having a, a break in the marginal distribution of the franchise conditional on the fiscal system, uh, but that the marginal distribution of the franchise is stable. So that basically means, uh, summarized at the bottom here, if everything breaks in a particular year, except for the franchise, then that's evidence again, that the franchise is causing the fiscal system. Now, if you're thinking about what uh, these two, the two tests are doing, then in a nutshell, the first one is saying, find a year where something happened in the, uh, in the franchise process, and then check what that did to the fiscal, the, the two processes for the fiscal system. The other test is sort of saying the opposite, saying now find a year where something happened to the fiscal system, and then check what happened to the two series for the franchise. And if it so happens that the marginal distribution for the franchise in that particular year doesn't break, but the conditional does, then that is evidence that the franchise is causing the fiscal system. Now, in terms of the, uh, the, the way that we would look at this, uh, in terms of getting evidence of this, we would like to see evidence coming from both of these tests in order to be convinced that the, a particular causal order is actually there. And in particular, I think it would be super hard to convince you and lots of others if we went out and said that we found evidence coming from this sort of test here for the redistribution hypothesis, which basically means every time that the fiscal system changes, then nothing happens to the franchise. Okay, that means that the franchise is causing the fiscal system. That's logically true. But I don't think we could sell that as a strong result. It could back up results that are coming from the first test here where something happens to the franchise and that is consistent with the redistribution hypothesis. So I think we, we need both of these in order to establish a causal order in the, in the data. <clears throat> okay, so let me just sort of uh, <clears throat> give you a, a quick over, overview and then on how this then uh, gets put into motion if we, we're gonna do this in practice. So before we do any statistical analysis, we need to, we need to think about, uh, to address this question about what, is, what do we mean by a structural break? So we do a historical narrative analysis 
where we are looking for plausible structural breaks in the, uh, in, the, in the political system and in the fiscal system. And then we put them into a database. So this is, so we lock them up and say, these are the years. And then we would basically not be willing to accept a statistical test or break that is identified in a particular year if it doesn't match anything that we could have we found in the historical narrative that would suggest that something should have happened in that particular year. So it's being used as if you like sort of a reality check on the structural breaks uh, analysis. And it's done before you, uh, you do any of the statistical analysis. Then you do the statistical analysis, I'll say a bit more about exactly how we're gonna do that. Then we have that rule that we accept statistical breaks only if they match with one of the narrative events. And then once we have that, we can then use that algorithm I showed you to establish the causal order. And we want to have evidence from both of these tests in order to, to be, uh, be happy uh, arguing that we have found a particular causal relationship. Okay, so <clears throat> now um, what could possibly go wrong here? Okay, so at so besides all the small or not actually small, also very important issues about how do you actually implement this, uh, there is sort of an underlying problem issue that could that, that definitely could uh, could mess this up. This is already um, kind of uh, come in uh, it, for the question that, that I got about the what what about have an autocracy that uh, that gets into a democracy? What would happen then? And that is uh, uh, there could be other things that uh, basically causes um, structural breaks in both of these uh, distributions. And if we have that, that would be a problem. Um, now, this is a lot weaker than the standard conditional independence assumption that we have to make in order to do a causal inference in a, in a regression model. But nonetheless, it's a, it's a, it, is a, it is a problem and we need to do something about it to make it more plausible that that assumption is satisfied. Uh, so the way that we do that is that before we do any of the statistical analysis on this, we filter the data, which basically just means run a regression on the data on some on all the things that we want to filter out. In particular, there are, are kind of two very important candidates for, for why, the, why there could be structural breaks uh, in something else that would affect both the fiscal system and the, uh, and the political system, and that would be war, and the other one would be uh, basically uh, economic recessions and so on. So we're going to try to take, take, that, take that out so that we hope that what is then left in these filtered series, the residuals from those regressions is, uh, is not contaminated by these types of structural breaks in underlying, in underlying processes that are not directly related to the, to the things we're interested in. Uh, okay. So these factors that you identified might cause the breaks. Um, any possibility that might be, they might be correlated with the structure breaks related to ENF. Uh, related to what, sorry, I, I, you broke out there for a second. Okay, so um, the first step you filled in out these factors. Yeah. Right, that might cause the breaks. Uh, my question is whether it's possible that these factors might be related to the breaks in the, uh, the, the uh, ENF. Yes, there could be, uh, but <clears throat> what we are what we are trying to rule out here is that there are some underlying breaks in these ENFs that are caused by something that has nothing to do with the redistribution hypothesis. And I think that the prime candidate would be a war that uh, comes in. And obviously, what that can do is uh, lots of examples of that. You need to spend lots of money during the war. And then on top of that, there might be pressures to have a, a change in the political system as well. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that we're trying to trying to, to rule out. Okay. But I think your question is sort of uh, implying is, are we throwing some of the action out with that in the sense that uh, is it possible that, that uh, the, some of these other events would actually also be related to the, what we're interested in and could be used for that? So I think there's a trade-off there between trying to check them out and, uh, and, and getting this assumption of uh, no structural breaks that causes both of them out versus actually finding a result. Okay, thank you. Okay, so much for the, uh, the theoretical background to this. So let me tell you about 
what we, we are actually doing in terms of the implementation of this. So we are looking at, um, so, okay. <clears throat> so we look at the United Kingdom, it's kind of where we live. So I live, so this is where we are doing stuff. Um, <clears throat> and we're looking at the, uh, what is the historians call the long 19th century. So we are starting in 1820 and the, this sample ends in 18, 1913, just before the, the first world war. Now, the first world war is uh, of course, uh, uh, an infort unfortunate historical event. Uh, it's also unfortunate for what we want to do here because we have to stop before that because we get into that we there's just so many things going on that we can't separate them out and if you are familiar with british political history you would know that we are then missing out the the, the fourth of the big changes in the in the voting rights in the united kingdom and also the fifth where women got it but we can't really do anything about this we got to stop there we're looking at i'm going to tell you about central government we also looked at local government uh, spending. Now, why do we uh, want to do it for the United Kingdom? Well, as I said already, we need a long time series for this to work. And we also need uh, to have a, a setting where there's sort of a, a gradual change in the political system. So we're not ending up with a situation where there's one big reform and that's sort of the end of it. And the United Kingdom is good on that because there was this uh, gradual extension of the franchise. I'll show you some evidence on that in a second. And then, of course, the other advantage is that uh, lots of historians have been writing lots of books about, about this, uh, this period. So there's a very well-documented fiscal history uh, and also a political history that you can dig into to do your narrative analysis. And then finally, it's relatively straightforward to get uh, high quality historical data in order to characterize these processes, both at the central and at the local government level. So all of that sort of speaks in, in favor of, of, of doing this on, on the United Kingdom, but of course it could be done in many other countries as well. Okay, I appreciate that this uh, particular table here is not that easy to, to see, uh, but let me just sort of briefly talk you through what it is. So this is the, this is the basic, the, the log from the historical narrative uh, analysis. So what we got here is the years where something happened to the fiscal system and to the soft rates. So you start with the soft rates, that's relatively straightforward. Uh, there we can identify the big changes. Uh, three of them were the, the franchise reforms that happened throughout the long 19th century. So the first reform act in 1832 and the second one in 1867 and the third one in 1884-85. And we also coded up things that has to do with secret ballot and other things. And we put in here the an event where the where the uh, the House of Commons uh, took over basically the fiscal powers from the House of Lords or took it away from the House of Lords. So these are the structural breaks that we were kind of identified in the in the suffrage series as potential periods where something might have happened that would have caused a structural break in that. And the fiscal system, a lot of things are also going on. Some of them has to do with uh, taxation, so income taxation and also trade taxation. So this is the corn laws in 1846 is one big event like that. And we got some more coming here at the end of the period, which has to do with the uh, introduction of, uh, <clears throat> of differentiated income tax and pensions and even a progressive income tax in 1909. The one I wanna stress here is what is called the Glastonian fiscal constitution, which was introduced in the 1850s and taken away in the 1890s. So that was a very important innovation in the way that the public finances in the United Kingdom was run. It was the first time, for example, that they introduced an accounting system with double entries and so on. But more importantly, it introduced a system by which in the House of Commons, you could not have a, an expenditure <laughs> bill coming through until you have decided on what the total envelope for spending for that year would be. So they voted on this by deciding that we're gonna spend a hundred next year. And then once they decided on that, they would then vote up items of spending. And each item of spending would then get allocated a fixed proportion of the total budget and could not be spent for anything else. So if it was not spent at the end of the year, it would go back into next year's pot. And that system put a, a lot of constraints on what, they, what the House of Commons could actually do. And that was put in in the 1850s and then it, was, it broke down in the 1890s. And that's an important change in how the whole public finances worked. Okay, hopefully this gives you sort of an idea about the sorts of things that we would be be thinking about when we're looking at these uh, 
historical events that could have caused a structural break in the relevant fiscal or political system. Okay, so more pr sort of uh, practically, how do we measure these things then? Okay, so the uh, suffrage is relatively easy to measure because we have data, good time series data on the proportion of adult males that could vote throughout the period. And we can sort of code that up in two ways, either normalized with the total population or normalized with the adult male population. So these are our two measures of the franchise extension process. We call them E1 and E2. So that's measured in that way. And that's relatively straightforward. Now the fiscal system is more complicated because how do you actually measure that? And of course the fiscal system is complex. So we need to try to capture the complexity of it in, in some way or the other. And the way we have done that is to select uh, after having played around with lots of different things, select sort of three types of variables that capture the sort of structure of the, the fiscal system. Two of them uh, has to do with the, the size. So that is total taxes over GDP and total spending over GDP. So this is the scale of government involvement in the economy. Then we want the measure of the composition of what the government does. And we are can measuring have, that, but... Sorry, can I have a quick clarification question here? Yeah. Um, maybe I'm ignorant. So my question is, um, as the history developed, is this true that always that the sum of franchise extension goes from, you know, extend the voting rights to the poor and poor people. Is that the only dimension that the history developed or actually it could be, you know, it's not moving along the income distribution but in other dimensions? That could be true in other settings. In the United Kingdom is very clear. It goes down through the income ranks. And the way that they, we know that for a fact is that the that the uh, gradually, as you go from the first up to the, uh, the second, the third, and the fourth re reform act, what you're basically doing in the beginning is to start with a high income and property ownership uh, qualification for voting, and then you gradually lower it. And then eventually, after the first world war, you basically allow anybody. You take away all the income qualifications, and you allow any any adult male to vote, and some women as well at that point in time. So in the United Kingdom, it's very clear that the that what we are seeing is, is basically a franchise extension process that really does just lower the bar. And every time you extend it, you include a, a sort of a chunk of people with lower income than the, than the old uh, voter. So we think about a median voter model, then it's very clear what's happening. The median voters uh, is gonna sort of move down the income distribution as this, uh, this process is going on. And that's another reason perhaps for thinking that the United Kingdom is, is a very good place to look at this because this is, that, that process here is very clear in terms of its uh, mapping to, to sort of the theoretical concepts that we are interested in. It really, it really matches that very well. In other countries and in particular uh, in other settings, of course, um, uh, United States, if you're thinking about that, right, of course, the race is a big issue there. So it's not uh, maybe uh, also, yeah, there's also some income distribution aspect of that, but, but there's certainly also a racial aspect of that, which, which is sort of another dimension, but that, that was not the case in, in this particular setting here. Okay, thank you. Good. So, uh, so in terms of the uh, okay. the other two, so we have the. Okay, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, a quick question from uh, what you just said. So, does that mean that you probably can also use another measure of suffrage, say for example, proportion of you know individuals based on education or income profile? Mm, yes, uh, in principle. Except uh, you know, it would be hard pushed to say that uh, we, I would be able to give you that on sort of a, a long time series basis. Um, yeah, because you need uh, information for, uh, yeah, you need information on other parameters as well. Mm. Yeah. Um, there is information uh, we had used in some other work where you, uh, so that, so that, I mean, one thing that's nice about this period as well as these Victorians were very sort of uh, keen on actually ac accumulating data and all kinds of things and doing sort of a statistical, sometimes quite sophisticated statistical analysis of things. So one of the things that they did do both after the uh, second and the third reform, I was to do a, a very careful study of who actually got the vote because they were not, of course, when they're doing this, they're not entirely clear. They kind of have an assumption that yeah, we're going to include people with lower incomes and so on, but they did some surveys so you can see how how the, uh, how the new voters compared in terms of their incomes to, to the old voters. So there is information on that and some service done on those points in time. But, 
it's not get, getting it's not giving us a time series but it would be great if we could we could do something on that i agree with that okay can right I, so um, can i ask a quick one uh, yeah. i'll take you back a bit in terms of the theory that i mean the underlying theory seems to be that anyone who gets suffrage demands for more redistribution as you, as you go down the income order. But it could be that the suffrage itself is of value in the utility function. And in some ways, a substitute of redistribution or you know, income from the support from the state. And if I have that model in my mind, then there's, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't draw the same hypothesis that you have right now. That I agree with that. And I will, I will get back to that at the very end when there's okay, when we kind of have to engage with that question. So. If we are not finding a smoking gun when we are doing this, and nobody else to have looked have found the smoking gun either, is there something wrong with the theory, which would be one explanation. And I think you had just suggested an alternative theory that could explain why we shouldn't see any relationship between between these uh, between voting rights being handed out and uh, and the fiscal redistribution. And that's a, a, a possibility. Uh, I suppose we have to entertain that 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 could be the case. That that's what is behind it. There are other contenders as well to what might be going wrong here, but that's definitely one. So maybe if we sort of take a uh, yeah. hearty and view back. on this, we, we have rejected the hypothesis, we go back and formulate a new one and try that one out. Thank you. Okay, let me just sort of uh, uh, complete this sort of description of what we're doing here. So we have the scale as one, we want the composition uh, and we want the uh, rate structure as well of uh, what happens on the, on, the, on the tax side. So the composition is basically just looking at direct versus indirect taxes. The most important direct tax is income taxation and uh, the important indirect ones would be tariffs and, uh, and uh, exercise duties on, on, on goods. And then we are looking for the rate structure. We are looking at the top marginal income tax rate. So this is our sort of characterization of the fiscal system that we're going to be looking at. Okay, let me just show you the data. So here's how it looks like. This is the franchise. And here you can sort of see, uh, without having to do any sophisticated statistical analysis of it, that there are some structural breaks in this, right? So here's the first reform act, the second reform act, and the third reform act. You can see what happened to the proportion of the population that, the, that could vote. So we have these big jumps up at those points in time. Can I, can I also ask a quick question? Sorry, Toke. Um, so extending the right to vote to women, for example, let, let's take the US case, extending the right to vote, of vote to, to vote for women and African-Americans is different because women, you may just be, let's assume everybody's married. Then you just, the unit of decision-making may be the household. So extending the right to vote to women may just give those men, like that unit, another vote, but African American, African Americans may be different units altogether. So in that sense, it's, it, it's not the same in that you're going down the socioeconomic dimensions. These are different cases. I agree with that. So, uh, so, and, uh, so I think the null hypothesis and the female suffrage is that there shouldn't be any effect exactly for the reason that you just okay. uh, indicated there. Uh, <clears throat> In practice, there is some effects. So, so it's not there's something else is going on there. But, but that would kind of be a good good starting point. And for the uh, for the um, so the the, F, the so the racial aspect of it in the American context is harder to do a prediction on because two things are confounded there. You have a lot of black uh, African Americans in the sort of the time when we are thinking about this, or the 1960s and back after the Civil War, which are at the bottom of the income distribution relatively speaking. And then at the same time, they have a race identity. So how that's going to play out is, uh, is kind of a con is sort of a confound, you know, uh, confounding two different potential processes there. So again, yes, this is, uh, so that's again, so if, if you want to test the redistribution hypothesis, which is about this income dimension to it, we need to find a setting where that makes sense. And I think that's why, again, the United Kingdom makes sense for this, because here we really have that. So what we're seeing in this graph here is really what I was just describing. We are the, uh, we're including, uh, no, we're not talking about poor people in 1832. This is middle class, but they're poorer than the elite that controlled the whole thing before. Here we get some working class people in, and here we get a big bunch of uh, working class people coming in. So every time we go uh, up here over time, we get, uh, we get more and more people with lower incomes allowed to vote. Yeah, but I think, I think the lower income, the lower income dimension individually, if you look at women's income in their own right, that may be true, but maybe they're all married to the rich men. And then yeah, on the that's, that's true. Yeah, but remember okay. during this period here, that's just for me. 
<laughs> no women is going to be allowed to vote here. So women are not in the United Kingdom getting a right to vote until in eight, 1980. If you're married uh, and uh, okay. old enough, you would get the right to vote. And then 1928, they, they decided to give all women uh, all the voting age, which was 21, I think, at that time, uh, the right to vote. That so what we're talking about here is men. Okay. Uh, so the women, are, women, are not, the women are not into this. So that, that, that doesn't confound any of the things we have here. And that's kind of another reason for this 1918 reform that might have been interesting to have is not that we found on that one because we have both things happening there at the same time, women and uh, poor men. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just uh, back to the previous slides again, please. It looks like just the two just double, right? The red one double closed just about a double of the uh, the gray one. Yeah, that's that's because of the uh, denominator, right? So that's because roughly uh, the gender balance in the population, woman versus uh, a male versus a female. So this uh, the, the, the top one here is uh, is the oh. proportion number of people who can vote as proportion of the adult male population, and this one here is the proportion of people who can vote as a as a uh, proportion of the entire population, kids and all. So, so if you kind of look at it, I think the better one is probably the, the top one here is the one that, uh, but many people are using the other one here. So we have decided to go with both of them. But that the top one has the advantage of uh, sort of the, the denominator and that one is kind of the right denominator and not the... But if a uh, male versus female is balanced in the population, then the one just on the double, right? The red one double the uh, other one. It's very close to double. Uh, I don't know whether you check the actual number or not. <laughs> yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. Uh, why that is? I have to go back and think about that. Actually, I'm not. Uh, this, these data are actually not our data. They're con they're coming directly from uh, from Flora's uh, statistical works, uh, where he's calculating the two numbers in this way. So I have to go back and see what he's actually doing on that, in order to answer that question. Um, but one one is the share of men, the other one is the share of the entire population, right? So you uh, correct, yeah. We double the jump, I think. Yeah, I think it's good. Uh, yeah, I think that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I need to. I need to sit down and do the uh, do a little calculation on that to see if there's anything dodgy going on there. But hopefully not. Okay, let me show you the other ones, which are kind of more so, uh, perhaps more interesting. So this is the uh, structure of the of the fiscal system, and I kind of what I put in the years where the suffrage reforms are. And I kind of look at this. It kind of nothing much happens, and then sort of around. 1867 here, we kind of looks like perhaps there's a change in this, right? So maybe there's a structural break there if you just eyeball the thing. Here's the size of government, which is kind of surprising many people. So this is uh, basically how the British state evolved over the long 19th century. And what it is, is basically a very long period after the Napoleonic Wars, of course, where you start with high spending uh, and then retrenchment for pretty much all the way up to uh, some point in the early 1980s when it, so 1880s when it then begins going up a little bit again. So maybe there's a structural break there as well. So the downward trend is breaking and we start going up again. So maybe there's something. And yes, the income tax. A, sorry, the question there is um, what's going on in terms of fixed deposit strength? The, um, the governments during the 19th century can all borrow from the public, that is, are, are the governments issuing bonds um, uh, in order to finance expenditure beyond their revenue in this period? No, so, no. Um, <clears throat> You can see that what I got here is uh, basically government's is taxes uh, is the top one and uh, sorry the blue one is taxes and the the uh, the one the other one is uh, so we have a we have deficits when there are wars right so that's a war there and there's a war there and then there's a, there's a gap going here they are supposed to run a balanced budget so that's kind of part of the fiscal constitution and that starts breaking down as I said in this period here in the 1890s when they go away from this uh, Glastonian fiscal uh, fiscal rules uh, but the but the basic rule of the British Parliament throughout this period here was to try and balance the books right. and if there's a gap so between when these things it, then how, how did they make up the difference yeah okay so how did they make up the difference 
they did not issue bonds except to finance the wars. What they did was to have other sources of income, which is not directly measured in our taxes here. So they would have estate income and they would have other things like that that would give them, uh, that would give them income, that would, that would cover, the, cover the difference. Right. Uh, so they were not, they were not uh, engaging in sort of a, 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 sort of a, a bond issue on a regular basis. They were doing that when they, they were trying to fund the wars. Yeah. So uh, at, at what stage in British history did regular finances and bond issues begin to arise? Hmm. Um, to be after the Great Depression, I think. Yeah, I think, okay, I, I mean, I don't have any recollection that they did that before the First World War. So my, mm -hmm. my sort of a hunch would be that we are talking the uh, basically the interwar period is when this mm -hmm. is uh, setting off. But I might be mistaken on that, that there's something actually mm -hmm. did change at the point in time when the liberal governments came in before the war and they started uh, thinking about uh, expanding government, government activities in lots of different dimensions. Yeah, and it seems to um, me that one of the fiscal variables, I'm not sure that you're capturing here, I mean, is transfers, right? So I mean, in the modern economy, a great deal of government expenditure is on transfers. Yeah. And, and transfers are the mechanism by which we, we bolster the incomes of the poor, um, whether they be poor because they're pensioners or poor for other reasons, or disabled or something. Um, um, but that's not happening here either, is it? I mean, it, it's not happening at any point in your data series. Um, and so no, that's... So that yeah, the issue that bothers me a little bit is, um, you know, we can see what will happen when when the transition takes place between um, indirect taxes, which are always cheap in any economy, poor or rich, always cheap to collect, um, to income taxes. That transition, I would have thought, is is related to the scale of income per capita income in the in the economy as a whole. Um, and the extent of the bureaucracy and a whole lot of other things, which are probably long run things to think about when a transition takes place so that you can suddenly start to tax income as distinct from taxing transactions. I, um, I agree. That, yeah, no, that, that's a, a very, so that's basically, if you just uh, flipped this, that one there. Yeah. Uh, so that process there, yes, I totally agree with that. We have a, a paper where we looked at, at in, indeed looked at that question of when do you get the income tax coming in, where we are indeed looking at these, these particular processes uh, as well. So this is one of the cases where we need to net some of these things out. So that's why when we have, before we do the structural breaks on that, we have, we have taken the, the tax base out, which is GDP. So that that's yeah. not, not, not a good But the issue that. here is, is which fiscal changes advantage the poor. They're the ones that you think should no. be correlated with, yeah. Yeah. Uh, with, with fr franchise, right? So yeah. um, and that's not obvious to see. Is it? No, so let me just uh, address that one. So I think what you are saying is that <clears throat> the, the variables that we're using to characterize the system here is coming from the tax side of the budget and then the total budget. So what about looking at the expenditure side instead? And we have done that, and exactly for the reasons that you are, think, you are thinking about there, because is it the case that the, the redistribution has taken place is actually taking place because of welfare spending and so on, or public provision of public goods for that matter that is mostly used for by, by, by poor people. And the answer to that one is that the British central government is not doing an awful lot of this throughout this period. So the whole social security system is funded by local governments through the poor laws. And uh, Public education is not funded by the central government. It's funded by local education boards that have the right to raise local property taxes and so on throughout the entire period. So all the kind of, uh, and there was no public health interventions that are, are to speak of here either. So all these things that we might sort of in a modern, for the modern eye think about, this is the way that you help poor people, we're not really happening here in terms of the fiscal fiscal variables. So therefore, we did look at initially at, <clears throat> at sort of a, a, some uh, composition of the spending side as well. But most of the composition changes there is basically how much do you spend on the army and how much do you spend on sort of keeping the empire and the in infrastructure domestically up, up to scratch, so roads and, and things like that. 
these are the two big ones. And then there's a little bit of redistribution that comes in at the end of the period when you start from 1909, for example, you have public pensions and so on, but it's very, very tiny amount of money spent on that from the, from the point of view. And it's only at the end and the tail end of it. So, so that was the reason why we didn't go down that route uh, and, and keeping those variables in, in play because uh, that, that it was hard to make a case that there was a lot of redistribution going on in any of those really. And we ended but up with- Why, why is it that uh, government <clears throat> expenditure falls by a factor of four over this uh, over this period, look at this graph here. What is the government unloading in going from near twenty percent of the economy to about five percent of the economy over that sixty-year period, eighteen twenty to eighteen eighty? This is a dramatic fall. What what's what exactly is responsible for this? Is it something <clears throat> to do with the the army, we know that the empire was riding high over this period. Of course, growth was high over this period too. So the denominator is growing, but uh, the numerator sure isn't growing as fast as uh, the denominator. What's what's going on here exactly? Okay, so it's, I think the second effect is probably the dominant on this. Uh, so the, the starting point here is uh, that they're high spending because they're, they're just coming out of the economic wars at this point in time and the economy is not doing very well. So this kind of explains why we start so high. So we kind of leave that one out and then think about this thing. So this sort of long sort of 40 years or 50 years of decline in the size of government here. I think a lot of that has to do with not so much that the uh, government didn't uh, spend on what they used to spend on, but basically that the economy expanding and they're not expanding with it. They're keeping so that they the baseline spending that they always had on the, on the keeping a sort of an army of the empire running and the infrastructure and so on, which is what they're mostly spending on, more or less at the same level as they have done in the past. And as a consequence of that, the, the size of government uh, relative to the economy declines. And then that changes at some point in the 1880s where they start keeping up with the, what's happening in the economy, making more investments and, uh, and putting more money in. So I think that that's the reason for it. Yeah, well, that's unusual that also. That, that's unusual also because uh, uh, usually we think of uh, uh, demand for government services being fairly income elastic rather yep. than yeah. income inelastic as you were describing them. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. This is, uh, this is what I'm saying. This one is a surprising graph when you first look at this. So why on earth is it that this is happening in a, during a period where so Wagner's law is not kicking in here, right? This idea that there should be a positive yeah. relationship between economic uh, uh, activity and what the government does, at least it should keep up with it. Uh, and maybe even uh, in the relative version of that goes so expanding relatively, but that's not, not happening here. And I think a big reason for that um, going back to my historical narrative thing, the one thing that happens around here, which is kind of 1850, and this is we kind of we look at this uh, decline here, maybe that's the Napoleonic Wars, you're winding down, you have to pay back the debt and so on as well. So you stop sort of, you economize that. Then it's a bit flat here, and then you start going down. So that period here is probably related to the Glastonian uh, fiscal constitution when they put on these very, very strict rules on what you can actually spend on. So you, know, so you can think about the budget process. So you start deciding on how much can be spent for the year. And once we have decided we can spend a hundred, then we can argue about how we're gonna, how we're gonna divide it up. You can see that that's sort of within the sort of an accountability type model is a very effective way of, uh, of keeping a lid on total government spending. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I suggest one alternative? Uh, can, can we uh, hold up till the end? Because I think yeah. uh, took us just a little less than 10 minutes or so. So oh, if it's uh, yeah, I've got to get a few results in, I suppose. So let me just say, uh, okay. let's, let's, uh, let's hold on. Thanks, uh, Gerius. Good. Okay. So Bob, Bob, that was the data. So let me just very quickly, I'm not going to go into any of the details of this, but this is kind of where the, the nitty gritty comes in. Some we already asked some questions about it. So we, what we do in practice is we, we pre-filter the data with DDP and uh, war, so we're looking at the residuals. Then we have these time series, and then we uh, basically go through the sort of standard uh, stationarity test and lag structure things and model them as uh, auto-regressive uh, distributed lag models. So for each of the series, we would have a, we would have a, a model like that. Then we do the structural breaks test using the Bay and Piron method. And uh, now. If you're familiar with that, you would know that there's sort of many different ways you can do that, but different assumptions about what the search algorithm and so on is. Uh, so what we're going to say is that we want at least two of the tests, standard tests that are coming from, from their sort of package 
to identify a break before we would take it seriously. Okay, and then we've done that. We are then looking at the causal order by basically using the algorithm that I already showed you. Now, there's a question about uh, this, uh, this question about, okay, point T, what do we mean by that? So let me just say a few words about this. So uh, the, the first thing we are doing is that if we have a, a historical intervention in a given year, say 1867, there was an intervention in the franchise, there was a big reform. Then we would say that we take an interval of two years uh, sort of around that and say this is the narrative interval. So if we get a structural break that hits that sort of interval, then we will say that's okay, it, it, it matches with the, uh, the second reform act. So we're not requiring it to hit 1867. If it hits 1868, we will say that's, that's good enough. Uh, okay, so that's the first sort of uh, adjustment we allow for this. And then the second thing is that, in, um, <clears throat> okay, then how long does it take to have an effect? Well, you would have thought that if there's a change in the franchise, so nothing much is going to happen until they actually vote on some bills and stuff. So in one case, uh, we look at one parliament as sort of the, the lack, and we have looked at some extensions where we look at two parliaments as, as the lack structure in order to allow for some time for these things to filter through. Okay, so that's the, the way that we have been trying to deal with this. Okay, so let me show you some results. Okay, so this is the basically the results table. So this is kind of relatively simple to uh, to look at. So let me just show you tell you what it is. So we got the um, so I got to have two of these. So this is test number one or A. So remember that's the test where we have identified a year where there was a historically verified intervention in the um, in the in the franchise. And in that same year, we also find we find statistically that there is a structural break in the uh, in the in the two uh, uh, series related to the franchise, and then we are using the algorithm to look at what happens to the other two, and then we can get the patterns that we have in the table here. So that's what this table is showing us. So we have the the uh, various uh, possibilities here, the various measures of the franchise, the fiscal variables here, and what <clears throat> and then across here we have the what the uh, structural breaks patterns. Uh, tell us in terms of the causality, independent, uh, both ways, redistribution hypothesis, inverse causality, if you like. So what you can see is that we get one incidence where we have the, uh, um, the, where the data and historical narrative suggests that the franchise is causing the fiscal system, and that is associated with the third of these reform acts, the one in 1884, that uh, gives us a big, big increase in the working class population. But you also notice that we have lots of instances over here where it actually looks like it goes the other way. And that's true both for the third and for the second reform act. So that is the evidence we have of the redistribution hypothesis. The other things there are not consistent with it. What about the other test? So that, remember that's the, that's the opposite test. So now we're looking at a period or a year where there's uh, something happened to the fiscal system that caused a break in the fiscal system. And then we look at what happened to the, to the suffrage system in order to get a, a, a causality from E to F, we need the suffrage not to move marginally in that particular period. And here you can see that we get evidence as well. So this is basically the Glastonian fiscal constitution starting and breaking down. So these two things together then gives us sort of a glimpse that there might be something to the redistribution hypothesis. The other thing we can take for this is that uh, what about all this stuff over here? Now what you see down here is that we have nothing. So that basically means that if we think that there's reverse causality here, we need to accept that that evidence is coming from basically situations where <clears throat> something happened to the suffrage and in that particular year nothing happened to the to the uh, to the fiscal system and that then means that the fiscal system must be causing the franchise so it's coming from the indirect type of evidence and we have no direct evidence on that so we wouldn't take that as sort of uh, at, at a strong evidence of reverse causality because we can't confirm it with these other tests okay so that basically more or less takes us to the end so uh, let me just skip this one here in in the interest of time because I already said that. And then maybe say a little bit about this question here, which is the so what question. That is, uh, why is it that uh, it is so 
hard to find evidence of this uh, redistribution hypothesis. Okay, we already touched upon one, which is maybe the theory is just wrong. And there might be something there. Now, one possibility is that people care about something else than just redistribution. They like getting the vote and that makes them happy and that's, that's, uh, that's enough. Uh, but I think there's a more fundamental problem, I think, with, the, with, with this whole theoretical concept, even if we don't go to that sort of behavioral aspect of it. And that is, one thing is that people want something, that there's demand for redistribution. Another thing is that the political system actually deliver that. There's also a supply side to this. And maybe there are constraints on the supply side that they basically prevent these things from happening. And that's where we should be looking. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is we're just measuring the wrong thing. We already touched upon that. Uh, so one possibility is that it's uh, happening through the expenditure side. And we didn't look at that because it did not happen in that way in the United Kingdom throughout the period here. But there's another possibility, which I think is more of a contender here, which is there are lots of non-fiscal policy tools that could be used. If you get the workers the right to form unions, for example, as a consequence of a fiscal of, of a franchise extension, that would allow them to improve their lot. But of course, that doesn't show up as any fiscal redistribution for the state. So that's a possibility, and we're not we're not engaging with that here. And uh, the final thing is that one thing is central government. What about local government? Well, local government is super important in England during this period. So maybe that's where the action is. Now we looked at that, and there's not a lot of action there either. But there's still one outstanding issue there, which is there might be interactions between the two levels of government. Suppose you had a franchise extension to the parliament, and as a consequence of that, they gave the local governments the right to uh, set up uh, schools and fund them. Now, that would not show up in the, as a, a fiscal expansion with the central government, but it might have big consequences for, for, the, for the lot of the poor when the local governments now get the right to do these things and give, as a free school to, to everyone. So that, that is a possibility. And then, of course, there could be all kinds of other complex things going on. So let me just end with that. So that's kind of, I think, I kind of managed to keep it within the Thanks, time. Okay. Thanks to a very interesting presentation. Um, any questions? I see a hand. Yes, Michael, go ahead.